We've got a riveting hour uh, to talk about enterprise blockchain. But before we get started, I have a few questions for you. First of all, how many are here for their very first reInvent? A lot of us. How many, this is your second? Third? Four or more? Wow, that's excellent. OK, now, in your job, um, raise your hand if you are in more of a technical role, developer, builder type role. How many of you are involved uh, on the business side, a, a non-technical role? And how many of you, of you are involved in open source in some capacity? OK. Now, about blockchain. Is anyone working on a project, a blockchain project that is in full production? Hmm, crickets. How many have a blockchain um, POC or pilot going on right now? OK. How many of your organizations are interested in blockchain and are talking about it but haven't done anything yet? There's quite a few of you there. OK. So you guys are in the right place. Like I said, we're going to be talking about enterprise uh, blockchain and AWS's approach to it. And we use some open source protocols that we'll be talking about. My name is Tamara Dull, and I am on the open source marketing team with AWS. And my focus is on blockchain and IoT technologies. With me, I have the great honor of having Brian Bellendorf. He is the executive director for the Hyperledger project at Linux Foundation. So he's going to be talking to us about some of their projects um, that we're relying on. OK, you guys saw this. I, I know you're dying to know. What are the three most common questions that Amazon gets asked about blockchain? First of all, what is blockchain? Even though blockchain's been around for a while, we still get asked that question. Next in question is, do I need a blockchain? There are a lot of use cases that people come up with for blockchain, which in fact can be solved by existing technology. So the question is, do I really need to take that jump and do a blockchain? And the third question is, what is Amazon's view of blockchain? For this session, I'm going to basically focus on the first and third question. And then I'm going to pass it over to Brian, and he will talk about the Hyperledger technologies that are designed for the business. And then we'll come back wrap it up. If there's time for Q&A, we'll answer your questions in here. Otherwise, we'll take it out in the hallway, and then we'll get you moving on to your next session. Sound OK? All right. So how does Amazon look at blockchain? If you see on the left side, a lot of us um, on our organizations, we work with a centralized system, a centralized database, and everything kind of comes into that. And then our organization may interact with org other organizations that have centralized systems. And it's hard for those organizations to talk to each other. Now, what makes it different the, with a blockchain network is that on the right-hand side is you have a decentralized distributed uh, network. And what that allows is for every single one of those nodes to have its own copy of the database. And so it is not centralized. And so it does eliminate the need for the central authority in the network. And people are very um, um, excited about that um, uh, capability. When AWS talks about blockchain, we look at it with three components. One, it's almost like a three-layer cake. The bottom part is what we call the distributed ledger. Then we have the consensus mechanism. And then we have smart contracts on top. So I'm going to go through that very quickly, and then we will talk about how we respond to that. Now, this is the bottom layer. This is the distributed ledger. And you know what? This is a really important slide. And there's two typos on it. I cannot believe it. I just saw it this morning. Can anyone see what the two typos are? If you've worked with blockchain, you might be able to, to recognize it. The gray block is block 61. The yellow block should be block 62. And the blue block is block 63. This is very important. So in a blockchain network, you have what's called a dis distributed ledger database. And it is immutable, meaning that any data that gets into that blockchain, you cannot change it. You cannot delete it. Once it's in, it stays in that way. 
And so that looks like those transactions that you see at the bottom of each of those blocks. And so a block is basically a collection of transactions. There's a timestamp. And then in that block is the hash value of the previous block. And then there is a hash value taken of that complete block. Now, because it's, um, we've got these hash values, if you make any little change to any of those transactions, to any of that data, the hash value for that block changes, which means it has that cascading effect, and it basically nullifies the rest of the, the chain. All those blocks become null and void. So that's why they say it's immutable. Um, and then it's cryptog um, cryptographically secured, which is also a very nice feature. So this is a distributed ledger database, and it's the foundation of, of the blockchain. Next, we have the consensus mechanism. You might have heard of the term consensus algorithm. Um, that's, um, they, they're used synonymously. And so the idea here is you've got this blockchain network. How does data, how do transactions get into the network? Who figures out if it's in or out? And that's determined by the consensus mechanism. Um, some popular ones you may have heard is proof of work for Bitcoin, um, proof of stake, proof of authority. Those are just a set of rules that that community has agreed is going to determine how that data or that transaction is going to get approved and added to the blockchain. And then that top layer is called the smart contracts. For those of you that have a relational um, database technology background, this is comparable to what we call the stored procedure. But different from stored procedures where you could update and change over time, a smart contract, once you put that on the blockchain, remember the blockchain's immutable, you cannot change that contract, you cannot delete that contract. And so this is a way to allow the network to automatically um, transact um, you know, without any human interaction. So those are the three layers that we talk about. I think Brian will go into it a little bit uh, more. Blockchain has a wide use of cases. It, we've been talking a lot about or hearing a lot about it in the last four or five years. That white paper by Satoshi for Bitcoin was actually written in 2008. So it's been around for a while. And Bitcoin is, you know, um, has made the blockchain term a lot more popular because it's one of the mo most popular um, uh, applications. However, there are a lot of use cases for blockchain across a lot of different industries. And if any of you uh, heard Andy Jassy last year at reInvent, he was talking about some of the services that we have around blockchain. And he, um, the one thing that we do at AWS is we don't go after a shiny new object just because it's a shiny new object. What we do is we listen to what our customers want. And our customers started coming to us and telling us that they wanted us to have a, a, a blockchain service. And so like, so what do you really want to be doing with blockchain? And so they started telling us about the different use cases. And we realized that these use cases fell into two different buckets. So for example, you got supply chain, supply chain transacting with suppliers and distributors. You guys read about that a lot these days, you know, the, the salmon from, from egg to plate and all that. So there's a lot of different use cases, but there are two different buckets. So one on the left-hand side is the ledger with a centralized trust. These people still wanted that centralized database, but they wanted the immutable characteristics. They wanted it to be uh, verifiable. They wanted it to you know, um, uh, be secure. On the right-hand side, there were use cases that were truly decentralized in nature. And that would be like your mortgage lenders. You know, wouldn't it be great to get rid of a lot of those middlemen and, and, and be able to transact in that way? Or retail with, with loyalty programs. There was a lot of different use cases. So as a result, AWS um, released two different services. One was the uh, QLDB, Amazon Quantum Ledger, um, database, and that one is basically, remember when I was talking about the three-layer cake, that distributed ledger? That's QLDB, okay? And so that will handle those use cases. If you want all three of those stacks, you want that distributed ledger, you want the consensus mechanism where we're figuring out, you know, uh, what are the rules for allowing transactions in, and you want smart contract 
That's more of a blockchain. And so we have what's called Amazon Managed Blockchain. So Amazon Managed Blockchain, it has some, you know, some unique features. When we were talking to our customers, they were working with some of the different blockchain open source frameworks that were out there, and they were spending a lot of time trying to just get the infrastructure set up. And so the uh, AMB, Amazon Managed Blockchain, is fully managed. And so um, it allows you to interact across multiple AWS accounts. Literally, you go and say, I want to create a network, and within 10 minutes, it is created. And then we based it on two open source protocols. One is Hyperledger Fabric, and the other one is Ethereum. And I'll get uh, into that one in, in the next slide. It is also scalable and secure. So you can easily scale your blockchain, um, you know, as, add as many nodes as you want. And it is also um, secured by um, uh, KMS, the key management system, okay? And then it improves reliability. Um, in in the, these protocols, they have the ability to, um, uh, it, we, it, it's dependent upon Apache Kafka streaming service. When you get uh, Amazon Managed Blockchain, we actually replace that with QLDB as the distributed ledger technology, okay? And then why Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum? Why did we choose those? Because that's what our customers were asking us about. They are two of the um, most popular um, protocols that are out there. And so what's the difference? Why would I use one over the other? Hyperledger Fabric, it's great if you've got a finite set of known users. This is more of a private, permissioned type network, and it allows you to control who is in there and what they can do with each other. Ethereum, as you know, is more public. So if you've got you know, an infinite number of uh, use cases and users, then you will want to use the, the public network. And it's well distributed for you know, a highly distributed blockchain network, and it can grow and grow. So there's two different options that we have here. And to go into this a little bit deeper, this is where I want to introduce Brian. He, again, he is the executive director for um, the Hyperledger project for Linux Foundation. And he's going to be talking about the, the suite of projects that Hyperledger has, but he's going to be focusing on Hyperledger Fabric, Hyperledger Sawtooth, and Hyperledger Bezu, which is the Ethereum client. Let's welcome Brian. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, and it's good to be one of the first kind of sessions here at, at reInvent. This is pretty exciting. It's the first time I've spoken at reInvent, uh, and it's been really great to see Amazon Web Services pick up the uh, the kind of blockchain uh, thing. Uh, uh, we, uh, Hyperledger has been around for a couple of years now and has been at the center of kind of trying to build both a level of understanding of when you'd want to use these technologies, uh, but also uh, enough building blocks that people can actually get out there and build production networks with these technologies. So today, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, a kind of who we are as an organization, uh, a little bit about kind of permission and permissionless, public versus private, just kind of help you understand there's kind of a spectrum to this, uh, a little bit into those three frameworks uh, that, that Tamara mentioned, and then really how to get involved in, in what we're doing at, at Hyperledger. So we are an open source project project, full stop. Everything we do is public facing. Uh, every, it's really inspired a lot by uh, involvement from many of the people, uh, including myself, in projects like the Apache Software Foundation, uh, or uh, Eclipse, or uh, OpenStack, uh, but also really inheriting the template that the Linux Foundation has pioneered in building not just things like the Linux kernel, or facilitating the community and the commercial ecosystem around the Linux kernel and the Linux ecosystem, but also in projects like uh, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, which is the home for the Kubernetes project, right, and, and Istio and all these other great things, the Node.js and the JavaScript Foundation, all these different projects. In fact, at the Linux Foundation, there's over 150 of these different initiatives that are really a combination of pulling developers together around some common code bases, some common scope, some common theme, uh, and giving them the full power to set the roadmaps and the course of those projects uh, with just enough governance, just enough uh, kind of legal legal involvement to make sure that this is code that enterprises can, can deploy and trust without batting an eyelash, without worrying about the lawyers coming in and saying, like, where did this code come from? Uh, or somebody else coming in and saying, well, this is code that's just written by one company. How can we trust it? Uh, or code that came in from an anonymous source somewhere. You know, there might be patent issues. 
All of those issues are things that the Linux Foundation has engineered a process and a framework to be able to ensure that there's this, in a, there's this very efficient pipeline uh, for good ideas and good code to make it into commercial projects. Um, and then there's that second layer, which is getting the corporations involved uh, to not only you know, uh, have their developers work on the code, but also deploy it and realize commercial value from doing that, and making this, it, this virtuous cycle, right? And making sure that these technologies are actually community-wide technologies and not single vendor technologies. Um, we, I, I, so, so part of that is you gotta, you gotta be building code, right? You have to be providing the infrastructure, you have to be providing the governance and, and, and just enough process uh, so that people don't feel like they're wasting their time, they don't, uh, aren't confused about where to go. Uh, uh, but it's gotta be also be about creating the, the, the bits themselves, right? Uh, and, and, and really being focused on, on, a, on a kind of a ship mentality in, in the open source community. Um, but at the heart of it is the community as individuals, right? Not representing their employers, uh, but being there as individuals like Chris Ferris and, and uh, I, I, you know, who are representing kind of uh, as developers the right path forward for, for how the code gets built. Um, and then it's not just about kind of the, the, the five maintainers on this or the 10 maintainers on that. You have to help people uh, who are newcomers to the community uh, understand how the code's supposed to work, understand how to help each other kind of climb that learning curve, uh, do all the kind of DevRel kinds of things like creating tutorials and, 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 and white papers and that sort of thing, um, but then going out and advocating for it. And also in this space, helping people understand when you want to use this technology and when you don't. Um, to Tamara's point, uh, you know, this is a lot of trust. Uh, in fact, a lot of this is about trust. In fact, any use case that anybody will ever give you for blockchain technology uh, can always be solved with a centralized database, right? In some ways, you never need to use a blockchain unless you have an issue with who runs the central server, right? Uh, and I think we have lots of examples in this world of where like the one central server problem, it creates real problems for us, right? Uh, so blockchain technology is all about how do we federate, at the very least federate this out and ideally more push this out into uh, kind of a maximal degree of decentralization that's possible. Um, and that's particularly relevant in use cases like trade finance and supply chain traceability that cross international borders where there really is no legal authority to appeal to or a single company to appeal to to solve a problem when a problem emerges. So we at Hyperledger are trying to weave all of this stuff together, the developer side and a bit of the advocacy side and trying to kind of be the sober, sane adults in the room in the blockchain space. Um, and, and this is a space that even without our help is kind of exploded. Um, kind of hard to get a real sense of numbers uh, for this. Uh, lots of estimates put it at uh, kind of in the billions of dollars even already, and certainly in terms of uh, investment that's going in to building a lot of these POCs and pilots. Um, by our estimate, there's probably about 100 different production networks out there right now uh, in many of these domains, like uh, uh, different finance applications. Uh, again, supply chain has is, is emerged as one of the really big uh, use cases for this. Um, but as much as we work on the ground floor of, of uh, helping build these systems, we have to have the high level cover. So it's been great to see organizations like the World Economic Forum, publications like The Economist and others kind of legitimize this space as like, this is something that's worth paying attention to. Um, and uh, recently, uh, uh, Michael Del Castillo at Forbes uh, did a survey of the different uh, blockchain networks that are out there, and, the, and I think he pulled out 50 uh, major companies who are deploying blockchain technologies and asked them, uh, which frameworks are you using? Uh, and Hyperledger-based frameworks came out pretty well in that number. Uh, 23 of those 50 are deploying, uh, uh, or, or at least proof of concept piloting projects uh, uh, using Hyperledger Fabric. Um, uh, and th these add up to more than, than 50 because many of these companies are doing more than one of these. Um, three of them are deploying Hyperledger Indie, uh, which I just mentioned in passing is a uh, digital identity framework. Three of them deploying Sawtooth, uh, and then a bunch of the remaining on Ethereum, Corda, and Quorum, right? Uh, and these are blue chip companies. They're not just the, the, the Amazons and Microsofts and the to be kind of the early adopters, uh, but, but companies like uh, uh, Seagate and Siemens and UBS and Visa um, are looking at replacing kind of, or deploying this uh, in, in real production environments. Um, and, and to try to give you a sense of a spectrum as well, I, I, there's, I, I, you know, we kind of think of a dichotomy. Oh, you've got permissioned, private, kind of like, you know, small group kinds of things, or you have Bitcoin and Ethereum. And really, I, there's, there's this full, full 
spectrum uh, that, that I think uh, uh, is reflected by the fact that you've got use cases that in many cases uh, are, are about facing kinds of things like in the digital identity space uh, uh, there's many uh, these digital identity networks being built where you've got known uh, permissioned kind of nodes but 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 uh, the data itself is very public facing uh, you even have dApps being built on top of ethereum and 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 uh, uh, other blockchain networks that essentially are kind of private networks um, but really we're still trying to figure out what uh, uh, the right consensus mechanisms are the right smart contract languages are uh, to go and tackle many of these different use cases. And so it's kind of fun being in a young space like this. Uh, it can be a little bewildering as a developer from time to time. Um, but it's one reason why inside of Hyperledger, we took an approach from the very beginning that said, there's probably going to be more than one way to build these networks. There's probably going to be more than one appropriate application of these technologies. And by the way, there's a lot of different teams building these different pieces. Perhaps the most useful thing that's Ledger could do is bring together these different uh, uh, kind of tribes, if you will, kind of put them each other and say, okay, let's let's usefully differentiate in how Fabric work, might work, how Sawtooth, and how Indie works. Um, maybe that's even by, based on uh, uh, some use cases here and there. Um, but let's put them in the same room. Let's put them under the same license. Let's uh, have roughly the same development methodology. You know, the same use of public tools to be able to write this code. Let's make sure everybody feels comfortable coming in, asking questions, and starting that journey to becoming a contributor, perhaps even becoming a core maintainer on these projects. Uh, and, and, and I won't go into depth on all of these. I'll go into depth on three of them, Fabric, uh, Sawtooth, and Bezu. But just so you know, there's 15 of the kind of top level projects spanning a lot of different facets of the enterprise blockchain space uh, and an open door to more. Um, and I, I, it's, a, it's a really exciting time to be involved. So let me talk a bit more about Fabric. Um, Fabric was uh, the very first project that started I, I started us off. I, I originally developed inside of a small team at IBM who had kind of looked at Satoshi's paper, but also looked at kind of the history of transactional-based uh, systems going back to mainframes in the 60s and algorithms like uh, Byzantine fault tolerance uh, and Paxos and others that were kind of, uh, you know, not that distant. It was, it was the same idea. How do you take a, a network of peers and converge on a common system of record? And how do you implement rules that try to bring about a greater degree of, of and, and synchrony between all those different applications and a, uh, all those different nodes and a shared world state? And so Fabric was very much kind of from, come, came from, um, but took a, a, a clean sheet approach and implemented it in Go. Uh, kind of uh, taking advantage of a, of a modern kind of com programming language to do that. Uh, came up with a smart contract language called Chain Code, which unlike, say, Ethereum, uh, uh, you know, Solidity smart contracts, don't require everybody to have to run the code, but instead operate on kind of an endorsement kind of model. And then also came up with a number of approaches to really tackle what people were most concerned about uh, in thinking about replacing core transaction systems with this, which were around performance and scalability. So the idea is even if you had a network of, say, everybody in this room being a node on this network, uh, if what we really care about is the ordering service, keeping these, these transactions in the same order, uh, and, uh, uh, and we can fan out in terms of verifying the, the, that these uh, I, 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 you know, transactions were endorsed the right way, um, the ordering node is the performance, or ordering network is the performance sensitive part of it. So why don't we have a subset of us do the ordering network, and then everyone else can still validate and submit transactions, endorse other people's transactions, that sort of thing. So to some degree, a degree uh, some type of uh, heresy when it comes to kind of the more of the Bitcoin and Ethereum crowd, where you'd have different, different tiers of participants. Um, but in terms of giving a performance boost, uh, really, really meaningful. Um, it's now at version uh, 1.4. Actually, I think it's uh, 1.4.4 was just released last week. Uh, I, uh, in a very stable release, uh, we've created a lot of content around that. A lot of the deployments are now up at 1.4. Uh, if you're working with Fabric, you should be upgraded to at least one, four, three, or two, uh, if not not the latest, um, just for lots of performance and sta stability improvements. Um, uh, and and it's the the most widely deployed network out there as well. There's a lot of work going into a 2.0 with kind of a different life cycle for for chain code that I think is worth taking a look at. Um, but already it's 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 seen a, a lot.
lot of adoption. In fact, uh, not only is it on AWS, and AWS has deployed some other large networks using it, um, wired it up into their backends in some interesting way. It is also the only blockchain platform that is deployed as a managed service uh, uh, across all the major clouds worldwide. And that includes not just you know, the other ones that we know about uh, here in the States, uh, but also the major ones in China. Uh, and, and this is important because many of the applications of this, as I mentioned, are going to be crossing international boundaries. They're going to be about implementing global systems. And guess what? A lot of the supply chains start in the, uh, in the Far East. A lot of them start, uh, you know, or, or a lot of them cross these, uh, these, these global borders. And so it's important to have kind of the global technology community involved in that. Um, so that was, that's a really nice kind of milestone to, 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 to note. Um, and one of the first big deployments of this uh, was uh, driven by a company called DTCC. Uh, how many of you are familiar with DTCC? I had never heard of them before stepping into this space. Um, uh, okay, do you work at DTCC? That might be why. Uh, Oh, okay, good. Uh, um, but, uh, I, I, but DTCC is like uh, the, an organization started by the different bike messengers on Wall Street uh, who were taking shares of, of uh, public companies and like stock certificates and moving one broker to another. And they realized as the volume was exploding in the 1960s that moving physical stock certificates from one place to another was kind of silly. Uh, instead, why don't they just keep all the physical stock certificates in one place and move pointers, <laughs> essentially, from one, one broker to another? And so uh, DTCC was started as essentially a co-op owned by the brokers on Wall Street uh, to, uh, as, to solve the paperwork crunch that they were facing. Um, and in that time, has emerged as one of these centralized kind of, but, uh, uh, kind of glue kind of organizations. SWIFT is kind of another in the bank payment space. Um, that no one's really heard of, no one really understands, but they are there doing this kind of public service, if you will, for, for, the, for the financial industry. Even they, even though they're a central database, even they have had challenges in helping everybody who's involved in the trade of equities understand who owns what, especially with people uh, taking out kind of options and things like that. It's been more and more critical for them uh, to build a system that actually federates out uh, and decentralizes that database uh, rather than depending upon them as core critical infrastructure. Um, so they've been working with Amazon, with a number of other uh, companies to build, to basically disrupt themselves, replace their central Centralized database with a with a uh, with a with a hyperledger fabric-based network, uh, and Rob Palatnik, who's hanging around here, uh, uh, is a great supporter. He's the chairman of my board as well, so uh, it's it's really fun. Um, Nestle has also deployed this in uh, a supply chain setting uh, that uh, is, is pretty interesting. Fifteen different core commodities uh, uh, tracing, uh, partly for uh, kind of greater visibility uh, uh, across uh, kind of who's who's flowing what into the system, that sort of thing. Uh, but also for health safety reasons. Um, some of you might be familiar with this, but uh, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a discovery of E. coli in uh, uh, romaine lettuce uh, from Salinas, California. Um, and because of that, anybody who's bought any romaine lettuce from any farm in the Salinas Valley, uh, it, over the course of about two months, you know, if you'd bought it in the last two months, you were instructed to throw it out, right? And for retail and for uh, grocery distributors and for others, that represents a couple billion dollars of inventory that's had to be thrown out while they figure the source of this contamination. Um, networks like this are essential to being able to uh, take that from a throw everything away <laughs> to, you know, here's the very, very subset of what uh, uh, of we, should, we should be worried about, right? Here's the processing plant, or here's the farm, or here's the truck that, you know, this contamination spread on. We're not going to get that with centralized databases because no one wants to feed all that data to a competitor or put it in one place, but they're happy to share uh, uh, just enough metadata to be able to make tracing that kind of thing a matter of seconds rather than weeks by using a blockchain network. And so that's, that's where uh, tr uh, supply chain traceability networks like this one actually matter. Um, let me talk a bit about Sawtooth. Uh, so Sawtooth was really kind of the second project that came in. And if one could say that Fabric was inspired by kind of the history of transaction processing systems and, and Paxos and, and, and kind of this, this kind of older school kind of updated a little bit, um, Sawtooth came more from a pure play uh, kind of uh, Satoshi, or, or sorry, Nakamoto consensus kind of view, except using uh, algorithms other than 
work. Um, I don't know if, if you guys kind of face this, but when I kind of talk about blockchain technology to somebody, they always come back and are very concerned about the energy consumption of the platform, especially for anybody who kind of, you know, is worried about the environment and the climate change and that sort of thing. It can be kind of awkward to point to these, these big mining rigs. Well, the enterprise blockchain world is very much not driven by proof of work. It's very much driven by uh, uh, these other alternative consensus mechanisms. And one of those, something that Intel had uh, called uh, proof of elapsed time, which is a random leader election uh, uh, algorithm uh, that's provably random uh, using uh, uh, features in the secure enclave extensions inside of Intel's chips. Um, now, that's an open standard, so other chip makers could implement that as well. Um, but this is called Poet, and Sawtooth was the first implementation of it, and it makes it really easy to build uh, large networks with lots of participants, especially where the latency is high between nodes. Um, it doesn't have the high transaction uh, pace that uh, PBFT consensus can have. And in fact, Sawtooth has now added PBFT consensus. Uh, but it does have uh, uh, this much more, uh, uh, it's much better designed for these kinds of decentralized networks. Um, there are uh, some other uh, noteworthy things about Sawtooth uh, in terms of um, uh, you can always rebuild world state from the complete ledger history, uh, because all of the smart contracts, all of the things that affect the ledger state are embedded in the history. Again, much inspired by Bitcoin and Ethereum um, uh, as compared to Fabric. Uh, but there are other trade-offs as well. And really, between these two, uh, it's kind of like if somebody were to ask you, well, what's the difference between MongoDB and Postgres, right? Like, you can store data in both of them. You can query data from both of them, right? They make fundamentally, they, internally, they have fundamentally different architectures, but most applications, so to speak, can be written in one or the other. But as, as developers, you've all kind of come to work with either one of them, or they're you know, similar kind of you know, SQL or NoSQL databases, and you understand when one is appropriate and the other isn't. And we're gonna have to go through kind of this learning curve and learning process with blockchain technologies as well. And so when people ask, should I use this, or should I, should I use Sawtooth or Fabric, I tend to say, spend three hours or two hours or even an hour with each. Go through kind of uh, setting up uh, your first network, that sort of thing. All of these have great tutorials out there. All of them, you can bootstrap a network uh, easily on AWS or even on uh, your own laptop. And, and you'll see the differences between them. And there's other differences, like this is Rust rather than Fabrics and Go. Those are more cosmetic. Um, uh, but it's really worth understanding uh, uh, as you go through a journey of learning about these technologies, how these are, 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 are different in, in some meaningful ways. Um, uh, and it also has a pretty healthy clip. And it's used in quite a bit in uh, different supply chain uh, applications as well. Um, uh, and uh, I, uh, there's some interesting directions for it going forward. Um, and one of the things it implemented early on was uh, support for the Ethereum smart contract language called Solidity. Actually, a better way to put it is uh, support for the Ethereum virtual machine, which Solidity compiles to, and there's other smart languages that compile to. Um, and this was partly out of a, a initially kind of an academic interest in can we bring the Ethereum community closer to the Hyperledger community? Um, Fabric also then implemented support for Ethereum. Um, but I have to say, when I started on, on, on working at Hyperledger, uh, I started just after it was founded in December 2015. Um, I recognized there was a lot of really smart developers working on Ethereum and a lot of interesting kind of thought being put into de uh, decentralized application, dApps essentially, and even DAOs, even though there's uh, been a lot of uh, famous failures in the distributed autonomous organization kind of space. Like there was something interesting there and something that enterprises would start out doing some of the simple use cases around for, for great, you know, for initially for traceability and shared state, but eventually the role of smart contracts would grow. And eventually as these enterprise networks grew and grew, uh, we would have a greater need for uh, uh, networks that looked a little bit like how the public cryptocurrency networks worked. So we always kept a close relationship with the Ethereum community. We actually introduced an, an EVM uh, runtime called Hyperledger Burrow that when plugged together with Sawtooth and then with Fabric was able to add Solidity support to those different networks. Um, and then uh, in October of 2018, we kind of formalized a relationship with the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance which is a standards body focused on uh, uh, to help legitimize the use of that technology in, uh, in, in, uh, in the enterprise space, but very much as a complement to what we do. We're about building code, we're not setting standards, and I know the boundary between the two gets fuzzy at times. 
Um, uh, but then uh, building a relationship with them and the Ethereum Foundation, uh, one, what all that led to was uh, working with Consensus eventually to bring into Hyperledger a technology stack uh, that they had built to, uh, for deployments in the enterprise blockchain space called Bezu. Um, and that recently uh, came in and was adopted in August uh, as a full-fledged project at Hyperledger that uh, added to the complexity, for sure, of the different options available. But uh, it had some really unique characteristics and I think really added to the portfolio nicely. Um, and so Hyperledger Bezu is, is really our youngest project in a way, uh, though it is in production deployment in a couple of places. Uh, uh, Fabric's written in Go, Sawtooth and Rust, uh, and Python a bit, and, Go, and Bezu is written in Java which um, should make it more familiar to a lot of enterprise uh, developers out there uh, and corporate developers for sure. I, I, um, I, it also has been designed to run as a client, not just for permissioned uh, blockchain settings, but also for the unpermissioned global uh, blockchain networks uh, or, uh, that are related to Ethereum. So obviously the Ethereum mainnet but also the test networks out there. And experimental support has actually recently been added for the Ethereum Classic network as well. Um, and uh, uh, it also, it has a, uh, like actually Fabric and Sawtooth has a way to change the mechanism that's used. Um, uh, so it includes proof of work, because that's what you do on the per on permissionless networks, but also uh, proof of, of authority and then a, a IBFT, which is a another Byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus mechanism, the same one used in Quorum and a, and a couple of other uh, uh, blockchain projects. Um, uh, but the key thing here is that it's a single node that can run both on permission and permissionless networks. So as that as the spectrum you know, kind of changes, and as your network and the, and the businesses you're working with uh, grow and grow, uh, I think we'll be able to provide kind of seamless scalability you know, kind of from small to large in a way that might be difficult with some of the other blockchain projects. Um, and then by bringing them all together into one place, what we're really trying to do is help developers uh, understand kind of when they might want to use one rather than the other, but also this is all under the same license. This is all the same uh, uh, community of developers, all using the same processes, all trying to share the development burden between uh, across multiple companies. Um, and then, you know, as we can, trying to reduce the, um, you know, you want to amplify and, and make everyone aware of the meaningful differences between this. But let's also work together to try to reduce the, the, the meaningless differences, right? Um, call something a transaction the same across these three different, right? Have kind of unified docs across them we can. Um, so that's kind of what uh, uh, the role that we see Bezu playing for us in the long term is uh, helping uh, really round out the Hyperledger portfolio of different blockchain platforms. Um, so lots more to talk about and, and point to in terms of uh, uh, how we use the tools and things like that. Um, uh, we, uh, I, I, uh, we're very much a, a, a public facing open source community, right? Uh, you're more than welcome to join uh, the mailing list, join the uh, rocket chat, which is kind of uh, an open source clone of Slack, uh, join the other kind of forums we have, and ask questions, right? Um, uh, lots of tutorials, lots of people willing to help and kind of you uh, kind of serve as you come up on how to use these, but kind of with the expectation that as you come in, you're also going to help kind of bring in the person behind you, right? Uh, I, as all open source communities that really grow, kind of try to foster this sense of, 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 uh, of collaboration and kind of, you know, uh, 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 kind of mutual growth, right? Um, and so uh, we have all the kind of standard tools, tooling that you'd expect. I use GitHub, uh, uh, using, using Jira, using GitHub issues, those kinds of things. We also offer continuous integration uh, kinds of tooling to the different projects so that it's really easy to know when, when bugs get introduced that affect the test suites and those sorts of things. Again, trying to be supportive infrastructure, but still leaving it up to the developers and then the broader community around them to set the ultimate direction for where the project goes. Uh, and all of that is transparent. In any case, anytime we notice that developers are kind of having a private conversation about a feature that should be added or whatever, jump in and say, no, let's at least visible and open to the other com uh, developers in the community so that they can understand that change, but also voice their, their opinion and Frankly, code talks, right? It's, a, it's really a duocracy kind of uh, uh, environment that we're trying to, to cultivate. Um, and then cutting across the different projects, we have a lot of common working groups. Working groups around 
Digital identity, for example. How should these different projects connect with each other about uh, representing users and personally identifiable information and all this complex stuff, especially in the blockchain world? Um, how should they I, I, you know, uh, describe their architectures? What parts are pluggable? Where is their opportunity to come together around common things like cryptography, right? Um, I, uh, how do we best support developers on the other side of the great firewall uh, and make them feel like first class participants in, in the Hyperledger project? Project. And so this all sounds bureaucratic, perhaps, but this is how we weave these projects together at a, at a kind of an interpersonal level. And then all of it is overseen by a technical steering committee, which is an elected body of, of developers by every contributor to the community. Uh, and they kind of approve new projects coming in and kind of help guide uh, projects that are struggling um, uh, uh, and, and try to figure out the right balance of just enough structure, just enough bureaucracy to help make sure that everyone's time is, is most efficiently spent. Um, so lots of interesting stuff happening there. And then um, for those of you in the room who are kind of more on the business side, who are just trying to understand when is this appropriate to use in different sectors, uh, what are the kinds of use cases people are starting to use, uh, uh, we run a set of kind of non-technical uh, special interest groups that uh, try to organize kind of who's doing what in, in these use cases, uh, writing white papers on, in, for example, the telecom special interest group put out a white paper on uh, fighting mobile roaming fraud using uh, uh, Hyperledger Fabric. Um, uh, so trying to really help these different uh, business communities understand uh, uh, who else is working on stuff and to try to build these networks together. We are not promoting a, a particular network or a particular governance model. Um, all of these technologies are kind of up to you to build into buzzing kind of networks and decide who's in or who's out uh, and how those networks should work. But we do believe it's important as everyone's kind of going through the, the, the process of learning how to build these networks that we work together and share those ideas. Um, we have a, 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 we've introduced this past year um, some training uh, and certification programs, actually. Um, and this year has really been the year where blockchain tech, enterprise blockchain technology has been professionalized. And, and so we're doing our role by trying to provide a, 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 a logo that people uh, can uh, do that expresses the fact that they've taken a test. It's actually a fairly tough test. We've had people who are fabric core maintainers tell us it's, it's, it's a tough test to take. Um, uh, uh, but it, it's a certification that says you know how to stand these nodes up uh, and stand a network up and uh, monitor it and, and keep it running, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and when performance takes a hit or when somebody deploys something silly, how to, how to adjust it, right? Because that's been a, a to getting this thing, these things bootstrapped. So we have Fabric Administrator, Sawtooth Administrator, and now Fabric Developer. Uh, we'll probably be introducing them as well for Bezu uh, pretty soon. Um, and and uh, all of these are actually essential to being able to build, uh, sorry, uh, being able to, to uh, uh, put together something we just recently launched, which is a Hyperledger Certified Service Provider Program. So if you've got a company that is starting to build blockchain apps or bo blockchain networks for other companies, and you're going to be doing it on AWS, um, this is a program that kind of gets you kind of top billing on our website as uh, a team kind of knows what they're doing by virtue of having three or more people who've passed this exam uh, uh, in, in the last uh, two years. So it's a, it's, it's a way of demonstrating that, you know, you're not just the, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's shown up uh, recently on the block, right? So this has been really important to launch. Um, and then uh, I just want to mention we've got our own event coming up uh, at the beginning of March uh, called Hyperledger Global Forum. Uh, it's in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, March 3rd through 6th. Um, uh, the CFT, CFP deadline's already passed. We've already announced our first wave of speakers and keynotes. Uh, but we'd really love to see uh, all, both developers there uh, and people who are uh, putting together kind of the business justifications and business kind of uh, thinking around uh, blockchain networks. Um, and with that, that's, that's really all I wanted to tell you about. It's a living, breathing community. It's something that is growing in many different ways the tech, uh, uh, from a feature point of view, from a project's point of view. But at its heart, it's an open source community. And so uh, to really get value from it, uh, we want you all there, but we also uh, really want you engaged in, in some way. So, uh, and I think even if you're using this stuff on top of Amazon Web Services, um, knowing about this tech, knowing how to deploy it, will make you all better blockchain developers and able to see more opportunities to use this in some interesting places. And so uh, I want to pass the mic back to to Tamara to take us home. Excellent, 
So like I was saying before, we have a lot of our, our customers that have started building their blockchain networks. And many of these customers, they were already working with blockchain technologies before we released the services. And they were running into the challenges in setting up the, the network, setting up that infrastructure, and taking a lot of time. And so the Amazon managed blockchain service is really good about getting you up and going. Um, on uh, Forbes, we have a, a great series that um, talks about a lot of these uh, customer stories and their use cases and how they're using blockchain. So I encourage you to check that out. You know, and here's uh, you know Guardian. He, they're one of our ones, uh, one of our customers, and they just love the fact that we came out with with the service to kind of just help them because now that they don't have to worry about the infrastructure, they can worry about the applications and start interacting with the blockchain, and that's where they need to be focused anyway. So if you want to learn more, um, there's um, the uh, landing page um, for Managed Blockchain. There's also um, some workshops that are online that you can follow, like take two hours, which will actually walk you through um, setting up that network and building an application. I think it's kind of like a donor charity type you know, application that you can actually see the blockchain working, um, which is really good. Um, there's the Hyperledger site to, to go to as well, but there's also more. So I just went by last night over in Aria in the West Convention Center, down on the bottom floor, um, the Pinion uh, Ballroom. We have a really nice space. And our APAC team, earlier this year, they created a wonderful little demo of blockchain in action. It's a supply chain demo. And basically, we take one of our deep lens cameras, and it watches the refrigerator. And when the beer supply starts getting low, through a blockchain application, it lets the manufacturer know that we need more beer, and the truck brings beer out. So, from four to six every day over there in the quad, you can go over there and actually get free beer. Um, we also have, um, Brian was talking about Nestle. Um, Nestle, um, they have a chain of origin project going on and they are using AMB for that. And they have a single origin coffee um, uh, set up. And so from nine to three every day, you can go and uh, check out that demo and then get some coffee. So it really is beer and, and coffee. And so again, that's over in Aria, bottom floor in the quad. And you can also uh, get yourself uh, a, a nice little t-shirt there. In, decentralized, in decentralization we trust. Okay, this is like got to be the ugliest slide on the planet. You guys cannot read it, but if you did take a picture, this is a lot of the um, uh, blockchain-related sessions that are going on for the rest of the week. There, it's mostly chalk talks and workshops um, to um, actually go and start building stuff and asking some, some very direct questions. There is a session that um, talks about some of the use cases. It's with uh, Sony and Workday, so you can learn more about that if you're interested. But there's a lot of activity going on. And then on the flip side, remember we were talking about the distributed ledger technology, our QLDB? There's a lot of sessions on that as well. So with that, we actually do have a little bit of time. If you have any questions, you can come up to the mic. Um, Brian, you can come on up, up here. And if not, we will head on out.